Darling, you'll you'll introduce everybody, right? Or do you want? I'll introduce you, and then you'll do the introductions of the of the various uh, speakers. Yes, but I don't have anybody. I have the bios. Okay, I have the bios. So I'll give it to you. So here's, here's oh, that. All right. Um, Uh, good morning. John, I'm on? I think I'm on. Great. If everyone could take a seat, we'll begin. I'm Cindy Ernst, and I'm director of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center. It is a pleasure to be introducing this program, which is co-sponsored by the Latin American program, the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, here represented by its director, Robert Daly. Uh, the China Environment Forum. I'm not sure if I see Jennifer Turner around. Um, the Institute of the Americas, here represented by Vice President Lynn Walker, and the China Institutes of International of Contemporary International Relations, um, Kicker, one of the foremost foreign policy think tanks um, in in China. Um, we will be exploring the latest developments in China Latin American relations their place in China's foreign policy overall, a, a topic that will be addressed by Dr. Wu, and the political and economic logic that drive Chinese engagement in the region um, and in, in, in Latin America. As we all know, China has become a major economic and political force in Latin America and the Caribbean. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has made two trips to the region in something like 13 months. Um, he pledged about $250 billion in investment over the next two, 10 years at a Beijing meeting of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, known as CELAC. China is the primary market for Latin American natural resources, primary commodities, as well as energy resources, <clears throat> and a driver of regional infrastructure projects. There was a seminal report in 2012 um, co-sponsored by the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Asian Development Bank Institute that documented that trade between Asia overall and Latin America and the Caribbean grew on a yearly basis by 20.5 percent between 2000 and 2010, the so-called golden decade of South American growth. And China alone accounted for half of that total trade volume. The numbers are, are pretty impressive. Between 2000 and 2013, trade between China and Latin America and the Caribbean surged almost 2,500%, growing from about $10 billion in 2000, the beginning of the decade, to 257 billion by 2013. 
by 2011, several years ago now, China had become the largest <coughs> export market for Brazil, Chile, and Peru, and the second largest for Argentina, Venezuela, Cuba, and Uruguay. And it's no surprise, therefore, that the World Bank, along with other development institutions such as CEPAL, the UN um, Economic uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, um, noted that the growth in Latin America and the Caribbean um, beginning in 2000 is an important measure of its connections to China. Um, the, the impact has been direct by China's huge demand for commodities, and food such as copper, iron ore, crude oil, and soy. Um, and the impact of China is also indirect um, in that the sheer scope of China's demand for commodities has exerted upward pressures um, on their prices. And although this trend has tapered somewhat, it may not have ended altogether. Before introducing Lynn Walker, um, I'd like to um, extend special thanks um, to Christine Zeno of the Latin American Program, to Lynn's colleague, whose name is not written down in front of me, but who was also very, uh, very important in the organization of the seminar, and also to my colleagues at the Wilson Center, uh, the Institute of the Americas, and, and Kicker for joining with us um, today. Um, Lynn Walker is the Vice President of the Institute of the Americas, a, po a post that she has held since April and, uh, 2008, and she is the one who has been the driving force of putting China-Latin American relations in the forefront of the work of the Institute of the Americas. This is, in fact, the third time that our two institutions have collaborated, and there are uh, a number of publications outside on the table um, that testify to those, um, to those efforts. Um, before joining the Institute, um, Lynn was Mexico City Bureau Chief for Copley News Service. She has covered Mexico, Central America, and Cuba, and received the prestigious um, Maria Moore's Cabot Prize from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism for her outstanding coverage of Latin America. So we in, indeed have um, not only um, a qualified um, observer of Latin American politics and um, uh, Latin America's international relations, but also someone who has insisted that the Institute of the Americas take this on as a major part of its focus. Lynn. First of all, Dr. Aronson, thank you so much for uh, hosting us here today, and also uh, Dr. Daly. Uh, and the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. It's a great pleasure for us at the Institute of the Americas to have this ongoing working relationship and have these kind of opportunities to collaborate, but more importantly, to discuss issues of pressing concern in our region uh, as we go forward and watch changes. Uh, we all believe that discussion is very important to continuing strong relationships. So thank you for that. And um, I'd like to very briefly introduce our speakers today on the panel. Dr. Rampang is without a doubt the foremost expert on China-U.S. relations, and we're very honored and pleased to have him here today. He's the Vice President of the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, which is known as KICKER by its acronym. His research focuses on American foreign policy, China-U.S. relations, Asia-Pacific security, and China's foreign policy. Um, I could go on with a very detailed biography, but I want to thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Wampang, who just flew in last night from Beijing uh, to have this uh, opportunity to be with us today. So thank you so much. And Dr. Wu Hongying, who is the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Kicker. Uh, she is the first person I met when I initiated the Institute's Latin America, uh, China Americas program in 2008. And she welcomed me to Kicker without even knowing who I was or what it was I had in mind to propose. And I'm very grateful to you uh, for that ongoing relationship of many years. Thank you very much. And we've been able to also work together on programs in China uh, to establish this ongoing relationship. Uh, Dr. Robert Daly is the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you also very much for your collaboration. And we look forward to a good discussion today. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lian. And uh, thank you, Dr. Arneson, and my old friends, Daly. 
No, uh, Delhi is uh, more popular in China than in the States. <laughs> because of one famous TV drama, <laughs> Beijing <laughs> Beijing people in New York, oh. a very famous actor in that TV drama. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to know each other for more than 10 years. And uh, I'm very honored to uh, sit in next to Dr. Aronson maybe three years ago in the same place talking about China-American, Latin-American triangular relations. Mm -hmm. And today I'm very pleased to be uh, invited to join this very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, I was told to uh, give a very brief introduction of uh, Chinese new diplomacy under President Xi Jinping and uh, in particular U.S. and China relations maybe in 20 minutes. And then maybe my colleague, Dr. Wu, are talking about China, Latin American relations in general. And we both uh, welcome the Q&A after uh, our uh, brief introduction. Uh, when talking about uh, Chinese new diplomacy and uh, many things, uh, after she came into power in 2013, Chinese foreign policy or diplomacy uh, cha changed very substantially, maybe from low profile to more uh, to high profile, maybe more active, more assertive, more offensive. Lots of different uh, descriptions uh, here in, in DC. And uh, even in China, in the academic circle, we also uh, in the learning curve of uh, how to understand uh, Xi's new uh, diplomacy. Because in the past two years, we, we see lots of new events. Uh, for example, China now has established a Chinese type of uh, national security commission. Chinese NSC. Originally, we, 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 we don't have. But now we, we have Chinese NSC. And uh, we have two very important conferences in the last two years related to Chinese foreign policy. One is a, Ch a central working conference on our neighborhood diplomacy, which was held in uh, October 2013. And the last year, we have a very important uh, central working conference on Chinese new foreign affairs. So those two uh, conferences uh, highlight Chinese uh, uh, diplomacy. And also in the last year, we have very two very important international conferences. One is SICA uh, uh, in Shanghai. Mm. In this conference, she initiated the so-called uh, China uh, Asian security concept, which uh, rose a lot of uh, debates here in, in DC. And uh, also, the end of last year, we have a uh, APEC meeting in, in Beijing. He also initiated so-called uh, FTAAP, Free Trade Area in Asian Pacific. So uh, two important domestic conferences related to Chinese foreign policy, two very important international conferences on Chinese new diplomacy, and uh, NSC, and lots of uh, new organizations such as uh, the so-called BRICS Bank, Shanghai Cooperation Organization Bank, Silk Road Foundation, and uh, another is very popular today, the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Let alone uh, uh, President Xi uh, has lots of uh, new uh, doctrines, like a win-win cooperation, like a community of a common destiny like a new model of a major power relations, and so on and on. Uh, so how to understand the main thread, the main theme of Chinese new diplomacy under, on this very complexity of uh, events, doctrines, organizations, institutions, and, uh, and in the past two years, maybe she and Premier Li Keqiang visited more than 30 or almost 40 countries, different countries, lots of activities. So we do feel that Chinese uh, foreign policy 
It's a very big change. So how to understand this kind of change? I just give me my personal per perception as a Chinese scholar to view our own uh, foreign policy. I think first of all, mm, we should know the, the new background of a Chinese a new diplomacy. Many American friends uh, said that the new, uh, new diplomacy they call is a Xi's diplomacy, Xi Jinping's diplomacy. They think Xi's personality and Xi's personal style plays very vital role in Chinese new diplomacy. I think uh, half and half. Mm. On the one hand, of course, Xi's footprint was highly, you know, impact on the Chinese new diplomacy because his own background, his family background, his uh, working experiences from local steps to step to the highest rank of Chinese uh, leaders. And, uh, his, uh, and also he's uh, knowledgeable. He's, uh, he's the, the first Chinese president with a PhD you know, degree, doctor. He's a doctor. Remember that. He's quite knowledgeable. So he do his, his own uh, vision of uh, diplomacy. But for me, I think um, this is not the most important reason to explain Chinese new diplomacy. I, I think the second factor may be more important, that is uh, China is now uh, conducting the so-called new round of uh, reform, which compare with uh, the first round of reform uh, engaged by, by Deng Xiaoping 35, 35 years ago. So this time, some said this is the second round of Chinese reform. But the Chinese official never used the second round. This second round uh, described by maybe by foreign medias. We call it a new round of uh, comprehensive, comprehensively deepening reform. Given now we are conducting a new round of uh, comprehensively deepening reform, so this reform will touch upon almost every aspects of Chinese uh, political, social, economic, and foreign affairs life. So, for example, the comprehensively uh, establish of the so-called well of society in 2020. Uh, comprehensive, <coughs> comprehensively reform the Chinese Communist Party. Compre comprehensively reform Chinese uh, uh, legal system. Uh, so let alone comprehensively maybe reform Chinese foreign policy, you know, mm. structure or doctrine. Maybe one of the several pillars for the comprehensively reform. And the third reason, uh, a background I think, is, uh, is because of the complexity and the diversity and, uh, and the urgency of Chin the issues and the challenges facing to Chinese uh, policy makers today. today. Uh, for example, how to maintain a s sustainable economic growth you know, we have uh, maintained uh, uh, 9 to 10 percent of growth of GDP for almost 30 years. But it cannot uh, sustainable on this kind of uh, 9 to 10 percent. Now, according to the recent uh, CPC's conference, Premier Li Keqiang envisioned that in 2015, maybe Chinese GDP is uh, 7 percent. And he mentioned that even 7%, maybe 2 or 3% decrease in then 30 years or uh, in the past 30 years, but still a very hard task. Because today, Brazil only maybe 0.1%. Mm. And uh, maybe Russia, Japanese, maybe a 0%. So 7% still is an amazing job for China to do. But without seven or uh, around uh, GDP gro growth, I think uh, Chinese uh, social and political stability will have some problem. So how to, at the same time, maintain uh, social and political stability under the counter-corruption movement, under the new uh, challenges from the, 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 the violent terrorism inside Chinese territory, uh, is, is Turkey Islamic movements, and uh, it's a new challenge to uh, to China, and uh, and also 
how to avoid the so-called mid-income trap. Now Chinese per capita GDP may be only uh, six to seven thousand. Many Latin American countries may be reached to this level and the level going up. Now we are in the same stage. Can China surpass this, go beyond this trap to become a G per capita GDP in 2022, maybe, maybe 12 thousands or 15 thousands? It's a very big challenge to, to China. And how to avoid the, the, the potential crisis or coming conflict between number one and number two, that is the US and China, rising power and the status quo power also is a challenge. How to avoid the conflict between China and the Vietnamese, Vietnamese or Filipino uh, because of the territorial uh, disputes. So all those new challenges, these are real challenges facing uh, Chinese uh, new leadership. So this is the third reason for thinking about Chinese new diplomacy. And finally, I think the change status of Chinese uh, international position. We're now changing uh, from a regional power to a global power. Mm. Maybe from, uh, from an economic power to a more comprehensive mm. world power. We are reluctant to call Chinese number two, even if all the other countries call China number two. But uh, undoubtedly, China now, uh, like the states, we are the only two countries the total GDP surpassed 10 trillion US dollars. Last year, Chinese GDP is at 10.2 trillion. Americans are 17.4 7, trillion. So those are only two countries surpass you know, 10 trillion US dollars. And the third, level, the third country is Japan. Last year, maybe less than 5 trillion. So, so this shows that U.S. and China relations today are coming more and more you know, important uh, than before. So those four uh, backgrounds is the precondition for us to know, understand the Chinese new diplomacy. How to overcome all those challenges is something that uh, Chinese new leadership thinking in the next 10 to 20, 20 years. And uh, firstly, I think how to deal with the major power relations, still very important for, for China. When we're talking about major power relations, the United States, Russia, maybe European, and India, and uh, maybe Japan. And uh, you know, uh, the first country that President Xi visited is, uh, is Russia. And the, the second year, she still put Russia as the first country to, to visit. It seems that uh, Central Russian relations today is uh, highly visible and highly uh, uh, important. Why? I think uh, because of that, uh, we have a long sharing border. And for almost uh, 100 years, the major threats or challenges are coming from the north, from, from the Russia and from the west. So how to permanently resolve this kind of a security concern is something that we want to deal, deal with. And we seize the new opportunity, that is that uh, uh, China is rising. Russia wants to be renaissance to the old glory. So both sides uh, need each other. Uh, we need American energy, natural, natural uh, gas, and oil. American, uh, Russian needs Chinese investment. So we are highly complementary. And uh, politically, we support each other. For example, in the 70th you know, victory of uh, anti-fascism and uh, anti-Japanese you know, war in China, and uh, Putin will come to Beijing celebration and President Xi go to, goes to Moscow to the celebration. So politically we support with uh, each other. 
And uh, uh, most importantly, I think, uh, in the economic front, we do need each other. So the first time US, uh, China and Russian relations is uh, is an uh, all-round way. It's uh, comprehensive, not only driven by ideological, by political, by outside factor, but also by both outside factor and inside uh, driving forces. That's why we said that uh, Sino-Russian relations now is in the highest level in history. And then China-European relations. We use that China-European relations now in the best period in history. Give you two examples. Last year, President Xi visited uh, four very important uh, European countries. And he's the first president to visit Brussels, the headquarters of EU, which shows the first time China put EU as a unity in Chinese overall diplomacy, not just put a single countries uh, one by one. So I think uh, uh, in 2013, uh, China-EU uh, trade amount is uh, 560 billion US dollars. And uh, uh, after she visited to UU, both sides agreed that to 2020, our trade amount will surpass one trillion US dollars, which seems that in the next several years, we will have 5,000, we will have 500 trillion potential. It's a very big, you know, benefit to uh, European economy, which is still in the edge of a financial crisis. Another example is that the recent AIIB, you know, almost all the major European countries decided to join. Great Britain, Italy, France, Germany. So I think the reason is quite easy. They think they want to seize the opportunity of the rise of China to upgrade its own economy. Because uh, uh, European is not the United States. You have a, you have the uh, you have a U.S. dollar or world currency to save your economy, but the euro is not that old currency. So they still needs the bilateral trade relations with China to you know promote its own economy. So that's why we say China-European relations now is in the in the best season uh, in history, and. Uh, China-India relations, I think, is uh, going back to the right track. You know, President Xi is the first foreign uh, leader that uh, the new Prime Minister uh, Modi met in Brazil, you know, BRICS conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, Xi last year visited to India for a very good you know, summit. And uh, in the coming May, Modi will pay visit to, to China. Everybody in China, um, in the world, just uh, focuses on U.S.-India relations, India-Japanese relations. But at the same time, India still want to develop a very good relations with China. We have a very big problem on the border issue, but we both decide that uh, we won't we won't uh, hinder the, the relations just because of the border issue. We want to go beyond that. So in terms of that, we are highly expecting the coming visit by, 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 by Modi. So generally speaking, I think the major power relations today, China is uh, doing quite, quite well. And the second uh, category is our neighborhood diplomacy, I think. Uh, I still, it's OK. I think uh, today we, we, we're using four characteristics to describe the, our new doctrine of our neighborhood diplomacy. In Chinese, we call qing chen hui rong. Qing means amity. Cheng means uh, sincerity. Hui means uh, mutual benefit. Rong means uh, inclusiveness. Using these new words to be the new guideline for dealing with our, our, our neighborhood uh, diplomacy. Under this, I think lots of new uh, initiatives being uh, made. Most prominent is the so-called one belt and one road. One belt means the uh, Silk Road economic belt. This is a landing area. And the 20th, 21st century of maritime Silk Road. This is a very big grand strategy. So the very reason for China to initiate the, this very big project, 
I think, first of all, we want to use this to substantially change our relations with our neighboring countries. Originally, we just think that uh, we have uh, 14 you know, lending laborers and uh, eight maritime laborers. So we face, we have lots of difficulties. But if we change our mind a little bit, using connectivity, using the Silk Road, maybe the more laborers means more benefit because more convenient for us to do business than our liberal countries to do business with the United States because you are far away from that. So today we're using our new mindset to use belt and, uh, belt and road to connect, connection, to connect China with our neighboring countries. So, uh, of course, our relations with Japan, with the Philippines, and Vietnam still in some difficult time. But, but generally speaking, our overall uh, laboring relations today still, I think, in a very uh, good, good mood. And uh, lastly, I think, how to, where's the America? Hmm? Which is very far away from, <laughs> from China. But America always said that it's an uh, Asian Pacific power. It's not that far away. It's our, also our neighborhood. So how to deal with this special neighborhood uh, is uh, our new challenge. Some American argue that maybe American, America in uh, our new diplomacy is not, is not the first priority than 30 or 20 or 10 years ago. Seems that Russia is more important. But my personal impression is no. I, I still think in our new leadership, the U.S.-China relations is, uh, I cannot say the most important, but as, at least as important as some other major power relations. Maybe a little bit, bit more important. Uh, I give you an example. For example, uh, somebody just said that the first country that the President Xi visited is uh, Russia. But remember, even President Xi was a vice president a year ago, in 2012. He visited the United States. During this very visit, he initiated the so-called new type of major power relations. And in 2013, after he visited Russia, and uh, President Obama sent an invitation to Xi to have a meeting, and Xi re re responded very quickly. Then we have a Sunday night you know, talks in California. In 2014, APEC in Beijing, you know, October is the best season in Beijing. But a consideration of that uh, midterm election in this town. So we intentionally let the APEC you know, begin at uh, November 10th, which shows we think the Obama cannot be the third round of uh, absent of APEC. So it shows that uh, we put uh, US-China relations in a very important uh, position. And this year, in a very early time, President Obama sent an invitation to Pre President Xi to visit the states formally. And Xi uh, responded very quickly. So this, this year, we are expecting another round of maybe Sunny and style or Yingtai, Zhonglanghai. Last year, Yingtai just night talks and light walks, maybe. <laughs> and uh, this year, we're thinking maybe somewhere in the States, except for the formal visit, maybe some informal talks. And uh, I guess in 2016, next year, maybe Obama will visit China again because in, in China we'll host G20. It's our turn to host G20 next year. Mm. So undoubtedly, we're, Obama will come to China again. So this shows that U.S.-China relations are still in a very important and uh, right, right track. But uh, uh, the difference is that uh, the way to deal with the states by, Chal by Xi is a little bit different from his predecessor, I think. The reason why is because of that uh, U.S.-China relations today is changing, the nature of which is changing from super one superpower with another major power. Today, more like a 
number one versus number two. So rising power versus status quo power. So the nature of which has changed. So how to overcome the, the historical tragedy of number two versus number one is the first consideration in Chinese new leaders. Mm -hmm. That's why she initiated the so-called we need a new model of a major power relations to avoid the historical tragedy. But my sense is that so far, American is reluctant to accept this very innovation of the concept. I don't know why. Because for me, it's quite creative. For example, no confrontation, long uh, conflict. This is a must. I think many Americans still buy this. The new type of major power relations, there were three sentences. The first is a non, low conflict, low confrontation. The the second language is uh, mutual respect. Many Americans said that uh, mutual respect is uh, unacceptable, which because of, or means that Ch Americans will respect Chinese core interest. But what is your core interest? They think Chinese core interest is very vague and very broad. But in my opinion, that uh, mutual respect is not only respect as some single specific interest. It's more like a, it's some it's a, some kind of spirit, gesture, attitudes. Mutual respect is attitudes rather than respect some single events or issues. How to embody the new respectful spirit uh, attitudes is more important than some specific you know, issues. And the win-win cooperation is the third language used by Xi to describe new type of the relations. Win-win cooperation, I think we have um, lots of potential to, to pursue. For example, in Asian Pacific, I think she mentioned that the Pacific is uh, wide enough, big enough, can have both US and China to play. And we can jointly explore the Mars. We can jointly set the new code of conduct of, of a cyber security. Like last year, we have a jointly agreement of uh, climate change. So if both sides are uh, based on the mutual respect spirit, we have lots of things to do to avoid the historical tragedy. I think um, uh, my time is uh, almost up, so um, I don't want to uh, talk too much because uh, uh, U.S.-China relations is very, very comprehensive. I, I, I welcome uh, the questions maybe on, on this and on Chinese new diplomacy. I just stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Wan. We appreciate that uh, global perspective on China's foreign policy. And now I'd like to turn to Dr. Wu, who's going to speak with us about uh, China's foreign policy as it relates to Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen and friends, good morning. I'm very happy to be here uh, to attend this seminar. Mm, at the first, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Vice President uh, Ning Work and the Institute of Americas for inviting me and my colleagues to visit the USA and uh, organize this wonderful seminar. Second, I would like to say a big thank you to Dr. <laughs> Dr. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Dr. Answer, yeah, uh, for hosting this uh, seminar. Mm, it is here. Uh, I, I could uh, meet old friends and um, Mm, no new friends. Uh, at last, uh, I would like to thank you everybody here for giving me a chance uh, to talk about sino Latin American ties. Uh, the topic of my speech is China and the Latin America, cooperation, opportunity, and the challenges. I would like to talk about uh, five issues. First, Latin America position in China's diplomacy. Second, China's new policies toward Latin America. And uh, the third, 
the, is the essence of the China Latin American ties. Fourth, the opportunities facing China and Latin America, the challenges facing China and Latin America. Uh, talking about Latin America position in China's diplomacy, I think that Latin America has been playing an increasing important role in Latin American diplomacy. As you know, success, successive generations of Chinese leaders have all attached great importance to friendly relationship between China and Latin America. Mr. Deng Xiaoping once made the incisive and the faceted remark that the Pacific age and the Latin American age would arrive together in the 21st century. Chinese President Jiang Zemin visited Latin America three times. President uh, Hu Jintao paid four visits to Latin America. This visit shows that China has cherished the friendship between the people of China and the Latin America. Especially, Chinese President Xi Jinping has visited Latin America two times, only in more than a year. In June 2013, Xi Jinping visited Trinidad and Tobago, Costa Rica, and Mexico just after his taking office in March. In July 2014, he visited Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, and Cuba. Obviously, the Chinese president paid visits to Latin America in the same range only in a year, which is quite rare and uh, unprecedented in the history of China-Latin America ties. It shows that ch new Chinese leadership attaches great importance to Latin American region. At the same time, more and more Chinese ordinary people know Latin America and like Latin America products. In the past, most Chinese people only know Latin America about uh, football, coffee, and the samba, and the tango. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is all. But now, more and more Latin American goods are entering Chinese market, market and the more and more Latin American manufacturing has made important contribution to China's economic development, modernization, and the urbanization. The Latin American products have also become common in Chinese daily life. For example, almost all Chinese families cook food with soybean oil from Latin America. We often eat Mexican bread, bimbo, at breakfast. We often drink chili wine at the dinner. More and more young people like to drink Brazilian coffee and they enjoy Latin American toasted beef. We often travel by Brazil's regional plane. More and more Chinese vehicles and the buildings are constructed with Brazil's or Chinese copper. Obviously, Latin American products and the materials are playing an increasing important role in the daily life of Chinese ordinary people. Latin America has become an important and a dispensable factor for China. In a word, for China, Latin America is a more reliable cooperation partner, an increasing important trading partner, an emerging interdependent partner. As for China's policy toward Latin America, I believe that to consolidate and develop friendly relations and cooperation with Latin American countries has always been a cornerstone 
of China's foreign policy. Earlier, on 28 November 2008, the Chinese government released an important policy document, namely China's policy paper in, on Latin America and the Caribbean, which is the first policy document of China's policy toward Latin America. And this document charted the course for the growth of bilateral relations between China and the Latin America in the new era. In particular, <laughs> in recent two years, <laughs> Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered several important speeches and gave important grading views on China-Latin America relations. President Xi Jinping clearly stated that the China-Latin America comprehensive cooperative partnership of equality, mutual benefits, and the common development will be established, and both sides worked together to build five into new concept. In the political field, we will enhance mutual trust through frequent high-level visits and the dialogue. In trade and economic front, we will strengthen cooperation for a win-win outcome. In cultural field, we will increase contacts between, the peop between our people, boost cultural exchanges, and learn from each other for calm progress. China will strengthen each other's coordination and the collaboration in international affairs. And then China will promote each other in overall cooperation and the bilateral relations. This is a five in one new concept. And this means new policy toward the Latin America. Especially President Xi Jinping put forward a new concept, namely China should uphold the right balance between benefit and the profit, as Dr. Yuan mentioned. When China we are focused on expanding bilateral trade and increasing investment to Latin America, Chinese departments and the enterprises should put more attention to consider local economic development and uh, undertaken more social responsibility. So we want to build a China Latin America community of shared destiny. As for the essence of China Latin America ties, I would like to describe it with with five words. First is equality. As you know, China always upholds the equality of all countries, irrespective of their size, strength, and the wealth. We respect the biggest power, such as Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and also we pay more attention to their ties with Cuba, Venezuela, and Peru. We respected the Latin Americans' sovereignty and the development path, and show mutual understanding and support on matters involving each other's core interests and the major concerns. The second word is comp complementarity. This means China and the Latin America exists in many fields, in many fields uh, with uh, complementarity. As you know, China is the second large, largest economy in the world, has a huge consuming market, strong manufacturing capability, and uh, increasing investment capability. At the same time, Latin America 
as an important member of the developing world, is rich in natural resources, with a huge consuming market and some quite advanced technology. So China and Latin America could make respectively comparative advantage to seek common development. This rapid development of the two-way trade between China and Latin America in the past 30 years has shown that the economic complementarities between China and Latin America have benefited the two sides and the our peoples. The third word is cooperation. This means China and Latin America ties are cooperative in all round fields. Some Western media said that China's investment focus only on energy or copper. It is, I think it is a lot right and a lot true. Besides energy, Chinese also invest many other fields in Latin America, such as electricity, agriculture, technology, infrastructure, construction, and finance. Another opinion is very popular in some countries that China investment in Latin America mainly focus on Venezuela energy. I think the opinion is a lot completely right. Because as you know, lots of Chinese enterprises also participate in some projects related to people's life, such as constructing the resident, resident house and the schools and the new social district in Venezuela. And the Chinese businessmen also join upgrading train system in Argentina and the building a new mineral laboring district in Peru. Until today, China Enterprises has completed more than 220 projects related to social and the people's livelihood, accounting for 60% of China's total cooperative projects in Latin America. Of course, there exist some places which need to be improved in China's investment and the action of Chinese enterprises. The fourth word is win-win cooperation. The Chinese-Latin American economy cooperation fully displayed the, the spirit of mutually beneficial and win-win progress. For example, the bilateral economic ties have de developed from limited room, volume and uh, and diversified structure to large volume. The volume of the trade between China and Latin America has increased from 12.6 billion US dollars in 2000. But until 2013, the trade volume reached 260 billion US dollars. According, this means accord, account for 6.3 of China's total foreign trade volume and is nearly 20-fold growth. Especially in 2014, under negative circumstances such as global economic gloom and the economic slowdown of China and Latin America. But the trade volume between China and Latin America are still steady and rising. The volume of the two-way trade reached 264.3 billion of US dollars, but just grows a little by 0.7%. But this achievement is not easy. 
At present, China become the top trade partner of Brazil, China, and Uruguay, and the second largest trading partner of Mexico, Argentina, Venezuela, Peru, Colombia, and Cuba. China has already become the second largest trading partner after the U.S. in that America. At the same time, China investment in Latin America has risen rapidly. In 2013, China's long financial FDI had reached 15.16 billion U.S. dollar, soaring by 42.9 percent. Until today, the stock of it has over 100 billion US dollars. Yeah. The investment has expanded from energy, mineral to infrastructure, manufacturing, agriculture, high tech and the information industries. In short, Latin America is not only the fast growing exporter to China globally, but also the second largest overseas investment destination only after Asia region. The fifth word I want to talk about, interdependence. In the past decade, the closer ties between China and Latin America reflected that China don't only seek its own interests and the don't explore Latin American market with colonial style. On the contrary, China has been striving to seek common development with Latin America by the way of cooperation. For example, according to the estimation by Economic Commission for Latin American, SNAC of the United, of the United Nations, yeah, Two years ago, each 1% growth in China economy led to the 0.5% growth of Latin American economy. Mm. But in recent years, the situation has a little change. According to the latest report of the IMF, it uh, predicted that each 1% fall in China economy will need to 0.5% growth of Latin uh, uh, 0.5 fall yeah, of the Latin American economy. This shows China's economy and the Latin American economy are become more interacted and uh, more interdependent. Uh, as for the opportunities uh, I think, uh, for facing China and Latin America, I think uh, mm, the bilateral ties are at the best time in history. We see that we are entering a new stage yeah, of the bilateral ties. This means, as you know, uh, with, mm, with the Visits of the Chinese President Xi Jinping, he put forward some new ideas of cooperation about the bilateral relations. And at the same time, we have a new trans-regional cooperation platform, such as you know, the China Latin America Forum. And at the same time, we upgraded new cooperation partnership, such as we, China, upgraded relationship with Argentina and Venezuela to comprehensive strategic partnership. Until today, China has owned five Latin American comprehensive strategic partnership in total. And also, we have a new five years cooperation plan. This means 
China and the Latin American ties have a new landscape. Second, I think both sides is planning and blueprinting for the future. This is very important. During President Xi Jinping's visit in last July, he put forward a clear uh, one, three, one plus three plus six cooperation framework for China Latin America cooperation in the future. In Chinese, Translation, please. Same thing, one plus three plus six. One, three, six, yeah. Said it's hard to keep these numbers straight even in Chinese. <laughs> yeah, this means, uh, what is one? One is means one plan, means uh, composing the Chinese, Latin American, Caribbean countries cooperation plan from 2015 to 2019. Three, three means three major engines prefer to trade, investment, and financial cooperation. Six means six major fields, means that the cooperation between the two sides will focus on energy and the resource, infrastructure, agriculture, manufacturing, science and technological innovation, and uh, information technology. There is very important uh, information that is uh, China and Latin America uh, decided to strive to achieve 500 billion US dollars trade scale and 250 billion US dollars investment stock in Latin America in future 10 years. Evidently, these plans and the blueprints will provide many opportunities and a great space for cooperation. But I think, in my opinion, there is some challenges exist for China and Latin America. First, I think the geography obstacle is still an important factor. Over 10,000 kilometers of the distance between China and Latin America always prevents from more contacts and inter exchanges. More than 30 hours of long journey restrain that <laughs> aspiration of many Chinese tourists to visit Latin America. Second, Cultural and the systematic factors limited the results of cooperation. As you know, there exist many differences between China and Latin America, such as in language, culture, ideology, political system, and the economic system. Those caused skepticism on China Latin American cooperation around the world. Third, I think China is a new normal and the Latin American economic slowdown will produce a great impact to bilateral cooperation, and such as uh, Vice President Ryan Peng mentioned. As you know, last year, China grew by 7.4%. And recently, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang predict that China will grow by 7% in 2015. This means the no middle growth of economic for China will be a new normal. But as you know, in recent two years, Latin America's economic is a lot good. This means China and Latin America have to look for new driving force and the growing points for future cooperation. Finally, I think maybe in my opinion, there is a new and uh, is a new issue: how to realize triangle cooperation among the China, USA, Latin America is significant to the future development of the Silo Latin American ties. We deeply know that. 
as the largest and the second largest economies. Only if USA and China keep cooperation, no comp competition, keep coordination, no conflict, would uh, world peace and the stability and the prosperity will continue. So is in the Latin America. We also deeply know that no country could compar comparable to the USA in influencing Latin America. I hear today, I know that na the USA has steer, the steer being the largest trading partner, the biggest investor, and the most advanced technology supplier, and the most important partner in security cooperation for Latin America. As a newcomer, China has been managed to consider the USA's perceptions about the sino Latin American ties, and they manage to con concern U.S. interests in Latin America when it expands its existence and strengthens the cooperation with Latin America. Recently, we are very glad to notice that the relations between the U.S. The US and the Cuba has greatly improved. In a history address on December 17, 2014, President Obama declared to the whole world, Cuba policy changes. This means that more than half a century of conflict and the confrontation between the two countries had been disappearing. Two sides are discussing the future. We know that in recent days, the two sides are discussing the issues of the normalization of the diplomatic ties. I think uh, as, uh, mm, I am the, uh, as you everybody here, at first I heard of this news, I, I was uh, surprised, yeah. Because uh, I couldn't, uh, uh, although I, I do, I do uh, uh, Latin American search for many years, but uh, I was shocked about uh, the news at first. I couldn't imagine that uh, President Obama could make a telephone call to Raul Castro, but uh, it happened, but it is true. This is fair to say that this is not only a result of adjustment of diplomatic policy of two governments, but also outco outcome of joint efforts of the state leaders of two countries. It is, uh, I think, in my opinion, it is uh, good news because it will benefit the development of the two countries and uh, provide a more favorable external environment for, Latin Amer uh, for the United States and the Cuba. It is a great thing because it is a changing history and the to some extent, I think it is a creating a new history. However, I believe there is a real normalization of diploma diplomatic re relations between the USA and the Cuba still have long to go. At the same time, we see that in recent years, the ties between USA and the Venezuela has been nervous, in particular, since the end of the last year, Obama administration took a new round of sanctions against Venezuela. And the Venezuela also take strong measures against the United States in response. This shows that the diplomatic conflict of the two countries has been elevated. Obama and the, and the Venezuela President Maduro criticized each other and the ties between two countries is getting worse. As a Chinese scholar, I think that it is a bad news because it needed to affect to the development of two countries. 
and uh, influence contacts and uh, inter exchanges between the two people of the two nations, and uh, results in negative impact to regional stability and uh, security. It is well known that sanctions are not good uh, policy, and the Q, by example, shows that any sanction produce no useless, and uh, I think it is unnecessary. So I hope that the United States will improve its, the ties with Venezuela and uh, solve their disputes and issues by dialogues and exchanges. As you know, the summit of the Americas will be held in Balama on April 10 to 11. I think this is the important occasion that international community observe the trend at the ties between USA and Venezuela. I remember that the last summit of the Americas, I remember the former president uh, Venezuela, uh, the former Venezuela's president uh, Hugo Chavez sent a book to the President Obama. This is very interesting. Generally speaking, how to realize the triangle cooperation among China, the United States, Latin America in Western Hemisphere is a new task for think tanks of three parts. We are, not very, we are very happy to see that China and the United States has been conducting a dialogue and exchange on Latin American affairs between the Department of State, State of the USA and the Direction of the Latin American Affairs of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China since 2006. This mechanism for dialogue is very conducive to reduce doubts and increase mutual trust between China and the United States. So I hope that with the great efforts of the three sides, we could uh, integrate the Chinese dream with the U.S. dream and the Latin American dream. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much to both our speakers, Dr. Wan and Dr. Wu. And now, uh, Dr. Daly, I'd like to turn to you for your comments and thoughts before we open it up to questions from the audience. Well, thank you. And I, too, want to thank Dr. Yuan and Dr. Wu for your very comprehensive overviews. Uh, the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States t uh, tends to look at most problems through this lens of, of U.S.-China relations, and that's an important uh, but at times also a limited lens. So excuse me if my, if my remarks uh, on your presentations have those limitations. Overall, I think that China's growing relationships with countries throughout Latin America uh, are a very positive thing and should be viewed not in zero-sum terms or as a competition and should not be uh, premised by talk about whose backyard, who is operating in. I think that we all live in, in a condominium now and we need to get the condo rules right and talk of backyards is outmoded. Uh, so that properly managed, I think that China's uh, investments and China's trade and other sorts of relations in the region can work for China, can work for the many countries of Latin America, and can work for the United States as well. And I would say that broadly about the more active foreign policy that Dr. Yuan described moves like uh, the new Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank can bring new investment, new resources, new insights to major world problems, again, if, if they are well managed. So my, my broad take is that China's activities, China's diplomacy in Latin America are to be welcomed. I tend to see the phenomenon that the two of you have been describing uh, as part of a, uh, a two-part story. The two-part story, which we see not only in Latin America, but in Africa, Southeast Asia, around the world, is one, the story of the United States in particular, but the rest of the world adjusting to, uh, to some reacting to, sometimes reacting against, and sometimes accommodating China's growing power. And this is an ongoing story. It's, it's too early to characterize the response to China's power. 
Uh, some of the signs recently have not been positive. You mentioned uh, America's response to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, I think this was poorly handled, continues to be poorly handled on the American side, yet it's not too late. This is not the end of the story. This was just an important Sorry. chapter. More broadly speaking, we see in Latin America the story of China's learning to become a major power. And I want to emphasize learning because we see changes uh, in strategies, we see adjustments as China goes forward. And of course, in becoming a major world power or becoming perhaps a second superpower, we, we can, might disagree about the, the words for that, but certainly becoming a major power, China is finding that it has to uh, adjust to the world as it is and not as it would like it to be. And this is a world that China cannot always manage or interact with using the same practices that it employs domestically. In Latin America, as in Africa, in the rest of the world, uh, China, whereas in its bilateral relations, its disposition may be to deal government to government or leader to leader. In fact, China is going into countries which are characterized in many cases, most cases, by vibrant civil societies, places where NGOs have big voices, places where there is a free press, places where interactions are determined by and constrained by law, places which, uh, countries which for the most part have more transparency uh, than necessarily obtains in China, places where there are human rights activists and environmental concerns. China must deal with all of these sorts of complexity that it can't manage as it manages them domestically. It's finding in Africa and Latin America that it's a complex, changing, highly contingent, uh, not always controllable world. In this world, China is finding one of its most important principles of international relations, namely non-interference in internal affairs, is running up against new challenges. It is hard to invest heavily in countries to become a major lender, for example, in Venezuela, without being concerned about return on investment and therefore without being concerned about political stability, political legitimacy. China now has a stake in this and in other countries that require its deeper involvement and it becomes very difficult for superpowers to distinguish between involvement and interference. And China is finding the same thing in the Sudan and in Africa. Again, it, it's, we are seeing China learning. China has also been uh, subjected in this more complex environment in Latin America to the same sorts of accusations at times of neo-imperialist behavior that it faces in Africa. The essence of which is, again, from Latin, some Latin American critics, by no means all, uh, that the essence of this relationship is resource, natural resource extraction, and in, in turn, Latin America re-imports finished goods from China, and this is part of the uh, essence of colonialism. China hears these accusations. The accusation of neocolonialism bites particularly hard given China's own uh, history. But China again comes to an area that is new to China, but it doesn't come into Latin America. It's not a blank slate. Its Latin American partners have, their, have prior experience of working with European and countries and with the United States. So that while by and large initially Latin American countries welcome Chinese investment, Chinese expertise, Chinese infrastructure, there is still this background, this slate of experiences and suspicions based on their experience with the United States and other countries that China is not excused from. <coughs> Again, in this very complex environment, China is finding, and I think will continue to find, that some of the phrases, South-South cooperation, win-win uh, solutions, even economic complementarity, these are not always sufficient guides to policy. Not everything can be win-win. It's a world of conflict and confrontation. So how will China deal with that complexity going forward? This is a big question for Chinese diplomacy. I'd be interested, Dr. Yuan, in your thoughts around the world, but particularly perhaps in Latin America. China finds itself subject to the accusation of double standards and hypocrisy that the United States uh, is often subject to. So we see China struggling with non-interference uh, accusations of hegemony. How can China, in learning, and adjust, adjusting its investment and political policies in Africa, in Latin America. How can China adapt one set of standards internationally and another set of standards at home? 
This also becomes a question. If it deals well with civil society, with transparency uh, in its overseas investments, how can it square that with moves that seem to be going in the opposite direction uh, in China? And of course, China's desire to make good deals, to make sound investments itself may also compromise some of these principles. You mentioned Venezuela as a, a comprehensive strategic partner. Uh, comprehensiveness itself casts some doubts on the ability to not interfere in internal affairs. China is now perhaps precariously tied into Venezuela's deeply troubled economic and social systems and will have to make adjustments to some of its policies for that reason. Uh, China is also faced with uh, President Maduro's increasing loss of public support. China wishes when it comes into other countries to invest in a way that is politically neutral, to come in without attached conditions. And this is very attractive for many countries. But when governments change over, it can work to China's detriment. And China has seen a recent case in Sri Lanka where it had very close relationships with a government that was opening up ports and other uh, opportunities to China. And then the government switched, not to an anti-Chinese government, but to one that was not necessarily going to honor the prior agreements. So this kind of complexity necessarily requires China to get deeply involved in a way that can easily be construed as interference. Um, we also see, I think increasingly, concerns in the countries in which China invests, perhaps having ties to domestic concerns. Uh, Venezuelan oil is, of course, extra heavy crude. The recent uh, documentary by Chai Jing, Under the Dome, about uh, pollution in China, specifically called on the Chinese government and Chinese corporations to refine oils to a higher standard in the interests of the Chinese people. Can domestic advocacy of that sort also have an impact on some of China's uh, relationships in Latin America? And there are other examples as well. Venezuela is one. Uh, we, of course, uh, see this Nicaraguan canal, which may or, not, may or may not be going forward. Uh, there's a lot of mystery about who exactly is behind this. And so this, this question of transparency itself is an issue uh, for China. I find it very hard to credit claims that the Chinese government is not closely involved in an investment of this import and this size. Uh, people in Nicaragua itself are asking these questions. What will be the standards uh, for environmental protection, for environmental impact statements? Uh, we see more and more test cases of this sort. <coughs> so those are the nature of China's challenges, I think, going forward. The United States at the same time, in my view, in both Africa and Latin America, has been too quick to take comfort, to, take, to find solace in Latin American and African critiques of Chinese investment strategies. We hear voices within these regions talking about Chinese neocolonialism, and I think we take too much comfort in that, uh, and it can mask complacency. Uh, in fact, China is learning, China is adjusting. You mentioned that China, is, in its challenges, is finding a need for more local development and more social responsibility. This is true. We see China adjusting its strategies in Africa and Latin America. My concern is that the United States, because it understands the critiques of China's strategies, becomes too complacent and continues to not invest or be as involved a as actively as China is, and that we, once again, miss opportunities there. So in my critique, I don't mean to uh, suggest that that is the final word. Again, it's the story of the world's adjustment to China's power and China's learning, and I see it learning more quickly than is often acknowledged to be a superpower. And I will stop there and I think turn it over to the audience. Yes, right? I think so. Thank you very much for your comments and your thoughts. And uh, let's see if we have some questions from the audience. Our panel? Yes, sir, right, right here. Uh, here comes a microphone down. Linda, if uh, I could ask people to please identify themselves uh, by name and by institution, wait for the microphone. Thanks. Yes, and I would make another request if you could uh, limit the length of your questions so that ev a lot of people have an opportunity to ask. Dayaho. <coughs> Uh, my name is Rafael Olarte. I come from the university. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, thank you very much for coming here, uh, especially Dr. Mr. Daly for coming here last night. Uh, uh, my question is this. Uh, I would like to know, uh, this, this question is for Dr. Yuan. I would like to know what do you see 
going on in China in terms of uh, how the people are feeling with what we hear on the news about pollution, air pollution in the cities. Do you think this is going to, to what do you think is going to happen? Uh, is China going to uh, start looking at different standards of, of extracting uh, uh, natural resources when they go to other countries and extract those resources? Uh, is it going to, to, to create a new par paradigm, a new perspective? What do you think? I mean, the, uh, how China deal with the air pollution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, not how it's going to deal with it, but what changes do you think are going to happen in China? Mm -hmm. Are you going to get used to the new level of pollution? Are you going to make a, a big change in how pollution is? Mm, okay. And is that going to have uh, implications to its foreign rela with its relations with the other countries? You know, we, we, we are from Beijing. Beijing today is famous for the very heavy... Sorry, it's just a screen. <laughs> 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 it's a very serious topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beijing is famous for its... Uh, originally, we, we think it's a fog. Now we use a smog. <laughs> which, uh, so we are the vis victims of the air pollution. But uh, think about... Uh, the Great uh, London, a century ago, and uh, think about uh, Chicago and the New York City, maybe 80 years ago, the same case. I think, first of all, we have to admit it that uh, it's a very natural uh, case in the process of uh, industrialization and modernization, because we are the late karma of uh, industrialization. This is the basic fact. Uh, secondly, how to learn the uh, experiences and lessons from the advanced countries like the United States and the European countries. This is what we are doing now in uh, several ways. First of all, we are very intentionally decrease the GDP growth. Maybe in the past 35 years, we just pursued 9% or 10% at the cost of uh, air pollution and uh, the natural resources. But now the Chinese government and the Chinese people are highly aware that uh, we cannot sustain a 9 or 10 percent at that cost. We should leave more space for our next generation. For now, the government decided to slow down, slow down intentionally, now to 7, maybe in the future, maybe uh, 6.5. I think it's a, it's a more sustainable development. Uh, secondly, we joined uh, the international cooperation. For example, we just signed uh, agreements with Obama. When Obama visited China during APEC at uh, climate change agreements. We both countries set a very good examples for the statement of international cooperation on the climate change, which shows that China feel an urgency to cooperate with uh, the states, the, 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 the two top, you know, uh, SCO2 emission uh, uh, countries. And, uh, and thirdly, we are exploring the, the possibilities of uh, new energy. We are the largest investors on solar you know, uh, uh, energy, wind energy. And uh, several times when Obama delivers his uh, uh, State Union speeches, he praised China's uh, performance in this regard. He urged Congress you know, to pass some bills, let America's new energy industry follow Chinese way, which shows, which in turn prove that Chinese in this regard will have done a lot. And finally is that uh, the, the educate the average people to live in very scientific way. For example, uh, less driving, more walking. And, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, consensus is very hard to be achieved in a developing country. But still, we're working very hard in middle class, uh, in middle school, in primary school, in universities, to educate our next generation and our generation to, you know, 
to uh, to have a more scientific, you know, lifestyle uh, in the future. Future, but uh, eventually, I have to say that this is a long process. We should be very realistic. We cannot achieve the lifestyle like the United States, which has already industrialized for more than 60 years. We're just uh, catching upon with that. I think China is how to balance the development and, uh, and, uh, and the efficiency and the people's lifestyle. It is the first priority for Chinese new government uh, to pursue. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question back here and then over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Won Ho Kim, visiting Johns Hopkins sites from Korea. Uh, very nice to listen to uh, Dr. Wu and Dr. Peng's uh, presentation this morning. Uh, I have a question each to both of you. Uh, first of all, for uh, Dr. Peng, uh, some U.S. former diplomats remember that there was a kind of a fear in the 1980s that Japan would overtake U.S. as a superpower in later. Right? But actually, it did not happen. Uh, there seems to be similar fear or similar anticipation uh, now that China would overtake U.S. in the next tw 20 or 30 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. What is your view about this? Uh, and for Dr. Wu, for the past couple of decades, uh, China and Latin America relations has been uh, intensified, apparently. I would like to understand uh, some push factors and pull factors. Apparently, as pull factors, Latin America's uh, diversification efforts for strategic and commercial interests, uh, and also uh, some financial cooperation. And as a uh, push factor, probably uh, China's uh, necessity for uh, raw material security, something like that. Would you like to add any other factors as push or pull factors. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Japan in 1980s, Japan the, the first. You know, it's a very famous story here. So many uh, compared to this China to uh, 1980s, Japan. I think uh, so far China is the only country that the GDP reached almost 60% of that of the United States in history, after American becoming number one economically in history. Uh, when Soviet Union collapsed, it's a GDP only 50% of that of the American, even if it's a military, almost the same of the, the states. So that's why maybe China has more potential than any other powers before to catch up on to the United States in terms of GDP total. But even that's the case, it's not a big a challenge to the United States because we have a 1.3 billion population and uh, almost four or five times of that of the United States. So even if our total GDP is the past of the United States, the per capita GDP during that time still maybe one fourth or one at most one third of that of the, of the United States. This is the something that we should keep into our mind. Secondly, a comprehensively national power GDP is just one index. We have a military power today. American national defense budget is uh, four times of that of the. China, and it's scientific, it's soft power, and it's allies. You know, sometimes Americans do not need itself to fight against <coughs> its uh, adversaries and enemies. Leading from the behind as its allies, we don't have any real allies. So the allies still constitute part of a national comprehensive power. So my conclusion is that even if uh, someday in the maybe in 20 years or in 10 or 15 years, 
uh, the GDP in total of China surpassed the United States. But in 21st century, GDP is a significance of GDP is a downgrade. And, uh, and as many Chinese leaders uh, repeatedly mention that, China don't want to be, don't admire American to be number one. Maybe our number one sometimes means both, you know, an admiring position and a very heavy burden. Our Chinese dream means let every Chinese people living in a good air, good condition, and uh, glory and uh, dignity and the sovereignty in, uh, utility. We don't pursue the so-called number one or number two. That, that is my very short answer. Thank you. Dr. Wu? In two months, uh, in, in two, in past two months, there is a new, there is a new interesting uh, phenomenon. Mm, we noticed that the wo trade volume uh, between uh, the United States and the Latin America has uh, surpassed over the volume, trade volume of the uh, China and the Latin America. This is uh, uh, first uh, time for uh, near near a decade. Oh. Yeah, mm, this means the mm, the trade and the economic cooperation uh, between China and the Latin America mm, has been losing some strong impetus. I think uh, in future mm, maybe China and the Latin America should find a new point to growth. This means I, I want to see that uh, although China economic uh, will grow, will grow uh, by 7%, but I think it is the highest growth rate in the world. So mm. Mm, with the- India. With the, yeah. India, but we'll surpass China, China this year, maybe eight percent. Eight percent. Yeah. So I think uh, mm, uh, with the with the economic uh, growth of China and uh, Latin America, looking for the economic adjustment uh, at now, I think uh, we can we can economic uh, cooperation in some fields such as the financial cooperation. Mm. We see that uh, the most uh, things that the America want is uh, to uh, is the uh, investment from China. Last year, uh, we visited uh, the uh, several countries of Latin uh, America. We, we are strongly feeling that many Latin America countries need China's investment. So I think uh, in, few, in future, China will strengthen the investment uh, in the um, infrastructure, agriculture, information, and uh, a lot of um, energy and the mineral resources. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm optimized yeah, about uh, the cooperation in future. Thank you. Uh, we have a question right here. I'm yeah. sorry. And then perhaps we can take Evan Ellis yeah. there in the, yes. in the middle. Yeah. It's, on. Okay, it's, it's on. on. It's on. It's on. It's on? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Barbara Stallings from Brown University. I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest complaints that Latin American countries have about the relationship with China has to do with the composition of trade, which has already been mentioned by both Mr. Daly and uh, Ms. Wu. Um, specifically, of course, it's that China is exporting industrial goods to Latin America, and Latin America is exporting raw materials to China. 
So I'm interested in hearing from both of our speakers, and Mr. Daly too, if he has any ideas, as to what China has been doing and what China can do in the future to try and help Latin America to what's called usually in Latin America, to raise the value of their exports, to do more exporting of manufactured goods, and in particular, of high-tech manufactured goods. So it's only basically Brazilian airplanes that are uh, making a big mark in the Chinese market. What can China do to help Latin America along these lines? Uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to state it clear that uh, mm, about the about the mm, cooperative fields, yeah, between China and the Latin America. Uh, uh, besides besides of the energy and the um, mineral uh, fields, but also we have uh, we have uh, good cooperation, uh, such as the. Mm, in the high tech product, such as in China, mm, we 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 use we use our many many provinces in China use the mm, use the regional use the regional play uh, produced by Brazil, yeah, and then we imported we imported many vehicles parts. From the Mexico, yeah, and and then we we also we also imported um, many uh, soybean from Brazil and Argentina, uh, but as you know, China is a, is a, is a is a bigger power and a major economy. We need the oil, yeah. We need the um, mineral mineral products. Um, so I think in future, I think China still need Latin American um, natural materials. I think this is uh, this is uh, reasonable uh, because I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, the the three decade of the of the bilateral cooperation um, shows that China and the Latin America. Um, has has made has made uh, respectively advantage of the um, comparative advantage. Yeah. Um, so we have a good cooperation. Um, but the way uh, I think uh, we our government and our businessmen uh, pay more attention to the when China seek the national interest and the businessmen's profit. We should pay more attention to the local economic and uh, mm, and uh, afford the more social responsibility. Such as you know, the uh, in Chinese uh, famous in Latin America, there is a famous Chinese company. This is uh, sold uh, Huawei. Yeah, solo uh, only. I'm sorry. Only Huawei, only Huawei implied the local residents for uh, about uh, nearly 2,000 people. So I think uh, one, is, one other thing that uh, the you know the cultural differences. For example, the Chinese businessmen do want to hire more employees from the local, but the local guys, you know, like uh, Brazilian. During the uh, afternoon of a Thursday, they are thinking about how to spring the, the weekend. And the, the local law sometimes has some lim limits for the deepening of the cooperation. Like uh, Argentina, they don't have the, the government don't have any you know space for rent for Chinese industry. So I think uh, it just. It's, it just not just focus on one side of the story of the bilateral relations. We should uh, learn more about the other side of the story. And the good news is that uh, after 10 or 20 years of interaction today, both sides began to upgrade our trade relations. That's why we signed a very big you know, project, 250 billion investment in the next 10 years. Thank you. Dr. Ellis. 
Thank you. Evan Ellis, uh, U.S. Army War College uh, Strategic Studies Institute. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Wilson Center. Uh, thanks also, uh, Dr. Walker, and, and thanks uh, to the three panelists for excellent presentations. Uh, my question is primarily directed to Dr. Wu, but I, I hope that uh, either of the other two panelists would feel free to, to also uh, inject. Um, as, as you know, uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, there was a small but important Chinese immigrant uh, population that, that came to Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, today, with the increased visibility to Chinese products and the sense of competition, as, uh, as our colleague has just uh, illustrated here, um, those Chinese communities, often hardworking, have come under increasing visibility. And uh, indeed, uh, the expansion of Chinese immigration, especially in the Caribbean basin, has, has been felt. Um, traditionally, when China was a uh, less strong power, it was not able to do much to help the rights of overseas Chinese. But now China is becoming stronger. As we've seen problems in, in Suriname, in Guyana, um, in the Dominican Republic, even in Argentina, um, violence and crime against Chinese communities, the Chinese government appears to be becoming more activist, more you know, supporting the rights of those Chinese. So my question is, as China continues to become more involved, continues to become stronger, do you expect that the Chinese government will continue to become more active in fighting for the, the rights and, and well-being of its overseas Chinese population in, in Latin America? Thank you. I think uh, one new uh, mission of Chinese uh, foreign affairs after the Central Working Conference on Chinese foreign affairs work is how to protect overseas Chinese interests, which is not uh, routine work by Chinese foreign ministry. And now getting more and more Chinese going abroad and uh, protection of overseas Chinese interests is a must work done by Chinese foreign ministry. But uh, there are some limits. I think we'll do this on its own merits. For example, if the overseas uh, Chinese interests uh, do hurt by some illegal uh, events or actions, we undoubtedly will help through the legal process. However, if the overseas Chinese people, you know, um, made some crimes, I think still according to legal process. So we are working very hard to make the new balance, balance between protection of their own interests and maintaining a good friendship with the local governments. This is something new, uh, testing Chinese new diplomacy. I think it's just new beginning. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Shen Yang from Tsinghua University. Question to Dr. Yuan Peng. Mm. And how do you see that the China's new policy would influence China-U.S. relations, and uh, would uh, the U.S. benefit from the new policy or causing more conflict or competition to the U.S.? Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, uh, U.S. still the most important bil uh, bilateral relations in Chinese overall diplomacy because uh, the, the United States st so far is the only power can comprehensively influence Chinese both domestic and international environment, including Taiwan issue, Tibetan issue, and, uh, and the regime and uh, social stability. So that's why we put the, the United States still in the highest level of the, of the relations. But given the new diplomacy that uh, we are more active, more assertive, in defending our sovereignty and the territorial uh, integrity, for example, in South China Sea, in East China Sea, this kind of uh, you know more decisive uh, solution, there is some potential contradiction with the Americans rebalancing to Asia strategy. So, how to manage uh, U.S.-China you know accommodation in Asian Pacific? So far, is the something new in bilateral relations of the United States and, uh, and China. 
for me, I think this is the most important challenge in the next maybe 10 years. But so far, we don't have any ideal solution mm. to deal with this uh, contradiction between US and, and China. But uh, the good news is that uh, the military to military relations in the past several years is uh, in the best period mm. in last uh, maybe 20, 20 years. This is a bottom line for both sides can avoid direct military conflict. Then we find some code of conduct in the maritime and in cyber and space. This is what we have done when Obama visited to Beijing last year. And I hope when President Xi visits states this year, both sides can change from MOU to the real agreements uh, to uh, militaries. As for some economic and ideological contradiction, I think both sides has already been a, a get used to this kind of contradiction mm -hmm. for, for decades. I think it's a quite under, uh, under control. So uh, in a word, I think that the current Chinese uh, comprehensively reform and uh, Chinese new diplomacy uh, is in the interest of bilateral relations. It's not a contradiction of the relations. Um, I, my question is with China's uh, interaction with the Latin America. Uh, Latin America? Yes, influence the US uh, interests in that region. <coughs> First of all, uh, even uh, Latin America has very close relations with the states for centuries. But uh, uh, as uh, John Kerry mentioned last year, Latin America is not uh, American's backyard. Mm -hmm. It's a place that uh, both China and the, the States can invest more energy in the future in this region. So we can achieve a win-win-win uh, result in this region. For example, the, the US-Cuba normalization. Mm -hmm. I think Chinese reaction the first time is that we welcome this kind of uh, re react, uh, the outcome. Because of Cuba deserve to be normalized the relations with the United States. And then we are thinking about how to achieve a better US-China relations, better US-Cuba relations, and better China-Cuba relations. And uh, America can play some kind of a bridge role in the future with jointly helping Cuba opening up and reform. If we are open-minded to think about in this manner and in this way, and uh, Latin America, which has no direct territorial disputes with China, no historical disputes with China, no ideological disputes with China, can become the real test for the new model of U.S.-China cooperation. This is my, my very bright answer to this question. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists today very much. I think we have come probably to the end of the time for our session. Uh, Dr. Arnson, uh, closing comments and sure. thoughts? Sure. Thank you, Lynn. I was, couldn't help be, uh, by, but uh, be struck by Dr. Yuan's comment that the current President Xi is the uh, first Chinese president to also have a PhD, which is, of course, mm -hmm. the distinction of President Woodrow Wilson and why the Wilson Center exists instead of as a monument somewhere around the city as this living memorial. So I can only uh, think and hope that it's foreordained that when President Xi comes to Washington, he will come here to the Wilson Center <laughs> and, give, and give a major foreign policy address. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you to all of you for joining us today, to our panelists who've come here from Beijing, to Dr. Daly, and a special thanks to Dr. Arnson for always uh, working with and being a great friend of the Institute of the Americas. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, thank Lynn. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great.